Until now, there are many people who hate the capitalist system, considering it unfair. Such people are inspired by the works of Karl Marx and advocate the abolition of private property and universal equality. In my opinion, communism is destructive, unjust, unacceptable and has many practical problems. Communists consider a society to be fair in which workers and everyone should work, own all the benefits created equally. That is, under communism there is not only legal, but also material equality. The modern capitalist system is arranged in such a way that a person receives the more material benefits, the fewer people can replace him. For example, a person who cleans the premises can be replaced by a large number of other people. The engineer who creates blueprints to build a machine will be replaced by fewer people, since not everyone has the skill to create blueprints, so the engineer gets a higher salary. A person who invented and started producing something, for example a touchscreen phone, naturally receives a greater amount of material wealth, since he is almost irreplaceable. Communism tells us that people are equal, which means that justice is equality. However, I think that no one will argue that each person differs from another, both innate abilities and acquired ones. Someone is physically stronger, someone is weaker, someone understands mathematics better, someone worse, someone has communication skills, someone does not. And this can be continued indefinitely. People are not equal. Justice is inequality. Dreams that in an ideal society material wages will cease to exist will forever remain only communist dreams. Material goods have always been, are and will be the main incentive for labor and human development. Lack of material incentives inevitably leads to stagnation. In short, the problem is that we should simply believe old man Marx, who considers labor power to be a commodity, and also that the value of a commodity is equal to the amount of labor time required to produce it. If we take Marx's word for it, we can actually discover the ugly exploitation of the working class by the capitalists. When a worker works more than paid time, he creates the very surplus value that is appropriated by the capitalist free of charge. Thus, capital grows, and the bourgeoisie grows richer. Is it necessary to explain why Marx, absolutizing the labor force factor in the formation of value, is fundamentally wrong? Marx neglects entrepreneurial ability organizational skills, the influence of demand on value and many other factors. This idea of the economy is a key mistake that forms an illusory picture of the world and further Marxist philosophy. You can treat communist theory and ideology in different ways, but these are just words. What happens in practice? In practice, every attempt at a socialist revolution resulted in a huge number of deaths. And the rule of the communists is characterized by repression, restriction of freedom, militarization and totalitarianism. The communists consider their regime to be democratic, an interesting communist democracy which is established in the course of revolutions and civil wars that claim an incredible number of lives. The civil war in Russia claimed the lives of more than 10 million people. More than 2 million people were taken away by the second Chinese civil war. In Cambodia, more than 200,000 people died during the hostilities before the victory of the Khmer Rouge. Even more terrible than the socialist revolutions 
is the structure that is formed when the communists come to power. A characteristic feature of communist regimes is repression, terror, and political persecution. With gaining power, the communists begin to liquidate the hated bourgeois class. People who have at least some capital fall under repression and are sent to camps for re-education or are completely destroyed physically. Communists love to re-educate. Re-education camps were set up in all communist countries without exception. Even in our time, people who hold wrong economic, political, religious views are persecuted in socialist China. The history of the formation and existence of communist regimes is full of crimes. The worst communist terror was the terror in Cambodia. Having proclaimed democratic Kampuchea, the Khmer Rouge staged a real genocide. Communism mixed with local nationalism. Intellectuals, entrepreneurs, Vietnamese, Christians, Muslims, Buddhists were massively exterminated. Modern research gives us a figure of 2 million deaths. Given that only 7 million people lived in Cambodia at that time, the communist system is not viable. To establish universal equality, a strong apparatus of coercion is required. The people who carry out this coercion are inevitably endowed with privileges, which contradicts universal equality. Likewise, the privileged top of the party believes that it expresses the will of the people, but in fact it imposes its views by force. Communism presupposes a uniform distribution of resources, which is possible only with full state control of the economy. Undoubtedly, state intervention in the economy is necessary, for example, to pull the state out of the economic hole, to give it an impetus to further development, or, for example, to carry out an anti-crisis policy. In a plant economy, the state is the only producer, which means that the decision that the population will eat, drink, wear, consume, is made by the state apparatus. Do those experts who create plants and determine the development of the economy always accurately determine public desire? and satisfy demand. The second main problem is the human factor in decision-making. Economic planning is carried out by experts and implemented by state executors, all shrouded in a huge bureaucracy. Corruption, withholding information, conflicts between various authorities are commonplace in a plant economy. But a bad plan can really cause serious harm. Even seasoned economists can make mistakes. When the centralized decision-making system makes the wrong decision, the consequences will be even more dire than in a capitalist crisis. Absolutely every socialist country experienced a famine that claimed thousands of lives. In 1949, the Federal Republic of Germany appeared in the territories controlled by the United States, Great Britain and France. And in the territories controlled by the Soviet Union, the German Democratic Republic appeared. For 41 years, the West Germany developed in a market way. The East Germany was planned. And by the end of its existence, the GDP of the West Germany was approximately $1.2 trillion, while in the East Germany it was $160 billion. GDP per capita in the East Germany was less than two times. People fled in mass from the communist paradise to the capitalist hell. An even more striking example is the comparison of the economies of North and South Korea. 
In 1945, the territories of Korea that belonged to Japan were divided into two spheres of influence between the United States and the Soviet Union. In 1948, two new states were formed on the Korean Peninsula, Republic of Korea and Democratic People's Republic of Korea. By 1960, having survived the Korean War, both states were among the poorest. South Korean President Park Chan-hee has carried out successful reforms aimed at industrialization and attracting foreign investment. The plant economy mixed with market mechanisms and caused the first serious economic recovery. By 1980, the country's economic situation had more or less stabilized. A serious liberalization of the economy began, and government intervention in the economy was gradually reduced. The Republic of Korea has been demonstrating incredible economic growth since the end of the 20th century and is taking a leading position in terms of macroeconomic indicators. The economy of North Korea is a plant mobilization economy. North Korea does not publish any statistics, but according to foreign experts, it is one of the poorest countries in the world. GDP has been stagnating for many years, and GDP per capita does not exceed $2,000. According to the South Korean Ministry of Unification, more than 32,576 people fled to South Korea from North Korea between 2001 and 2019, an average of 1,715 per year.